I want your soul. I received the invitation letter in my mailbox. The letter was in a golden envelope that had the logo of Hotel Rejuvenation on it. The beautiful design of the text read, Dear Mr. Nathan, you are cordially invited to our special celebration at the Hotel Rejuvenation. The celebration will include various events, including dinner, a tour around the hotel, and a special evening surprise event. Please make sure to check in at the reception with your invitation by 9 a.m. on April 12th. We look forward to having you as our honored guest. Sincerely, the Hotel Rejuvenation. On the back side of the letter it said, Note, this event has already been paid for and is non-refundable. In case of questions or complaints, feel free to contact us via email. The invitation must have been a mistake though, because I've never stayed in this hotel before, so I figured they could have confused me with somebody with a similar name. I decided to call the hotel to clear it up. I would have sent them an email per the note, but there was no email listed. This is the Hotel Rejuvenation, Clara speaking. How can I help you? A perky female voice resounded on the other end of the phone. Yeah, um, I received this invitation letter today, but I think there's been a mistake. I think it was sent to the wrong person. Okay, let me check on that. What is your name, sir? Uh, it's Nathan Rogers. R-O-G-E-R-S. There was a sound of typing on the keyboard before she continued. Mr. Nathan Rogers. Uh, yep, that's me. You have a reservation for the celebration on April 12th. It's no mistake. The system confirmed that it's already been paid for. Really? No, I don't think that can be right. I've never been in your hotel before, and I sure as hell never paid for any celebrations. Well, the celebration has been paid for as a gift to you. A gift? By who? At that point, I had more questions than answers. Uh, I'm afraid I'm unable to disclose that information until the event is over, as per the request of the person who paid, sir. And I'm obliged to inform you that the celebration is non-refundable. That is, in case you fail to show up before 9 a.m. on the reservation day. A long pause ensued. Sir, are you still there? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm here. Um, thank you. I hung up the phone, baffled. Who paid for this? I had no friends who would do something like that. Maybe it really was a mistake. Or maybe, or maybe it was a prank? But who would want to prank me like this? I don't have any enemies, so this didn't make any sense. After a long time contemplating, I figured it would be a good idea to just go there. I might as well treat myself with a mini vacation. Besides, it was non-refundable and the celebration could be nice. A few weeks later, I took some time off from work and traveled there. The hotel rejuvenation was located a few hour drive away from my town, nowhere near civilization. It was at a lakeside and surrounded by a forest, which made it ideal for summers if you liked hiking and dipping into the water. On the day I got there, the weather had been particularly bad and it took me a while to trudge through the mud and get to the parking lot with my car. You'd think a hotel would have a traversable road to it at least but not this one. The hotel itself looked pretty fancy, even on the outside, so I was pretty content about scoring this jackpot. Without any further hesitation, I walked in. At the reception desk, there was a young lady who gave me a big toothy grin as soon as I entered. Welcome to the hotel rejuvenation. What can I do for you? She sounded as perky as the person I spoke to over the phone a few weeks ago. Her name tag said Sarah, though. So this was a different person. Uh, yes, I'm here for the celebration. And I slid the envelope over to her. She inspected the letter, the smile never leaving her face, and I half expected her to slide it back to me and tell me it's a mistake. But when she looked back up at me, she said, Welcome to the celebration, Mr. Nathan. We'll begin with our tour shortly. Please proceed to the lobby this way and she gestured where I should go. 
I thanked her and opened a double door which led me to a big room, which served as a waiting room, I suppose, because nobody else was there. I sat on a big sofa, listening to the sound of falling rain outside. I then glanced at my watch. It was ten minutes to nine. Was I waiting in the wrong room? Before I could even process that thought properly, I heard something in the back. Someone was sobbing. I looked over my shoulder and saw out of the corner of my eye a little boy, no older than six years old. I only saw him for a second though because he rounded the corner and disappeared out of the waiting room. Now normally, I would have just ignored a crying child in a situation like this one. His parents must have been nearby and he could be crying simply because he just fell or something. But this was different. The crying was something like I had never heard before. It's as if the boy was actually legitimately sad and heartbroken, like really heartbroken. Hey kid, I called out to him and started to walk to the hallway where he just disappeared. Instead of a response, the crying simply continued. When I reached the hallway, the boy was there, but only for a split second before he disappeared at the staircase again, still sobbing. But in that split second, I saw he had dirty hair and ragged clothes and my heart dropped. No, it couldn't be him. I'm being ridiculous. I followed to where he disappeared with a stride this time and stopped in front of the staircase. All I saw was a flight of stairs going up into a darkened corridor that twisted around. I could no longer hear the crying either. Hey kid, are you there? I called out again holding my breath for any noticeable noise. But nothing. Now, feeling a little frustrated, I climbed the flight of stairs and before even reaching the top, I heard something crash on the second floor to the right. Kid, your parents are going to be pretty ticked off. I reached the top of the stairs and stopped dead in my tracks. I was faced with a very different corridor than on the first floor. The entire place was giving off some rusty color and the walls were dilapidated. Some of the lights weren't working properly but rather flickering here and there, illuminating the splintered doors. Oh, this is definitely a prank. I thought to myself looking around frantically for any hidden cameras, but there were none. And the feeling of dread at the pit of my stomach was only growing by the second. Something was very wrong here. And then I heard another sound, something that sounded like squeaking in the distance. It sounded almost rhythmical, lasting for around two seconds, and stopping for two more. Despite every fiber of my being screaming for me to get out of there, I followed the sound, ever so slowly, holding my breath and listening. It was just around the corner. Squeak, pause. Squeak, pause. Like a rusty door being opened and closed, over and over. I peeked around the corner and down the dirty corridor, there were bars right in the middle of it. Behind them sat the kid from before, facing away from me, moving his hand in one motion across the floor, over and over. He was the one causing that squeaking sound. It didn't take long for me to deduce that the sound was coming from his toy car. I stepped towards the bars, not moving my eyes away from the boy's ragged clothes and dirty hair. Kid, can you hear me? I called out to him holding my breath, and he didn't acknowledge my presence. Instead, he kept pushing the toy car, causing that unsettling sound over and over, which made my skin crawl with every turn. Where are your parents? I called out again, stopping right in front of the bars now. Upon closer inspection, I realized the bars were actually a door, but it was locked from the other side with a deadbolt beyond my reach. Hey, can you hear me at all? I was a little frustrated at this point, and the kid just kept pushing the toy car. Squeak, silence, squeak, silence. Josh? I barely muttered the name, which was preceded by a complete and deafening silence. The boy immediately stopped playing with his toy. The air suddenly became stifling as he stood up and very slowly turned around revealing a pale face devoid of any emotions, his eyes barely visible from his bangs. Oh my God, 
I said to myself before hearing a loud crashing sound behind me. Faster than lightning, I turned around only to see someone standing at the end of the corridor. The flickering light made it difficult to tell who was standing there, but the figure was tall and large, legs spread and shoulders tense, standing menacingly. Hey, what are you doing? I called out. Instead of responding, he started taking large steps towards me, and when he stepped into the rusty light for a brief second, I could see that this tall man had a surgical mask stained with blood and an apron that resembled what the butchers used in latex gloves, both equally stained with blood as well. I backed away upon the bars with no visible way out. Josh, the door! I looked behind me, but Josh only stood there, staring at me with a blank expression. The figure was approaching fast, every step he took bringing me closer to a fate I didn't want to imagine. Josh, hurry. He's gonna... he's gonna open the fucking door. I slammed the door with my palm over and over, the rattling of the bars co-echoing with the heavy thuds of the figure's footsteps. He was only a few steps away from me now. I felt myself falling backwards, realizing that the door was suddenly open. Thinking as quickly as panic allowed me to, I slammed the door shut and locked it with a deadbolt just in time for the butcher to reach out for me through the bars. He almost grabbed me too, but I backed away fast as I fell down. The man rattled the bars so hard I thought he would rip them right off the wall, but with a few grunts he just huffed and turned around, walking away as quickly as he came. I stared in awe as his figure disappeared behind the corner and with him the sound of his heavy boots upon the musty carpet, leaving only my heavy breathing audible. When I turned around, Josh was gone, and I went into full panic mode again. Josh, Josh, where are you? I rounded the corner thinking to myself over and over how I can't lose him again. I frantically screamed his name while running through the long corridor which seemed to stretch on for forever, always with the same light bulb giving off faint light and doors with the exact same scratchings on them. After minutes of running and screaming for him, I heard something from a nearby room. I put my ear against the door and heard giggling, like a child playing. Josh, are you in there? I put my eye to the peephole but was instantly jolted back. Something had fallen into my eye from the peephole and when I wiped it, my hand came back wet. I blinked, still retaining vision in both of my eyes. Just water. When I looked to the door again, Water was pouring out of the peephole and down the door at an impossibly quick pace. Josh! I screamed and started ramming the door with my shoulder. I couldn't hear giggling anymore, and I have no idea how this was possible, but by the time I rammed the door the third time, I was already ankle deep in water. The lights were flickering violently now, and the sound of something going through the floor was heard. Whatever it was, it was heading in my direction. I rammed the door again and again, more violently this time, and just when I thought my shoulder would fall off, the door gave way and I fell face first onto the floor. It took me a moment to collect myself and realize that all the sounds around me had suddenly stopped. I stood up and observed my surroundings. The hotel room I was in seemed untouched by the water that was coming out of the peephole just now. Except this wasn't a hotel room. It was my house, exactly how it was five years ago, before I sold it. I looked around in bewilderment. What the fuck is going on here? Daddy? I heard a voice behind me and instantly recognized it as Josh's. He stood there motionless, no longer in ragged clothes. He had a blue shirt and khakis, exactly how I remembered him the day he went missing. I hugged him tightly and burst into tears. He felt cold to the touch, but I didn't care at that moment. Josh, is it really you? I took his face into my hands. He wasn't just cold, he was freezing. What happened that day? Why did you never come home? You know what happened, Daddy, he said robotically. I shook my head in bafflement as Josh looked to the right and pointed to an open door in the room. 
I couldn't see into the room since it was engulfed in complete darkness for a few seconds before the lights flickered to life and revealed our old bathroom. I saw myself in the bathroom, giving Josh a bath. Past me looked like he hadn't slept in days, and I remembered this. When can I play with the other kids? He asked. Well, I told you before, Josh, you aren't like the other kids and you never will be, but that's okay. Why is mommy angry with me? Is it because I'm sick? Uh, mommy's just tired, I responded. She'll be fine. Josh craned his head to me. I'm sorry I'm this way, Daddy, he said, with begging eyes. It's as if he felt what was about to happen. Oh, it's okay, Josh. And then I had a meager smile on my face. I, I love you, Daddy. I love you too, Joshua. I always will. I then put my hands on his shoulders, stifling a sob. I looked away from the bathroom. I couldn't bear to see it, and I shut my eyes tightly. I didn't need to see what happens next, although I remembered it well. There was the sound of violent splashing water for a very long time, until it gradually became weaker and eventually stopped completely. With tears running down my face, I willed myself to look back to the bathroom. The past me stood there, looking down at the tub, with Josh's arms limply hanging from the side. The light flickered on and off a couple of times, and when they finally stabilized, I still stood in the same position. However, this time, I had on a surgical mask, rubber apron, and latex gloves, and they were all stained with blood. The lights then exploded, and the bathroom was engulfed in complete darkness again. I was on my knees sobbing loudly now. Josh's pale and lifeless body was on the carpet in front of me, completely soaked, his black hair covering his eyes. Josh, I'm so, so sorry. I moved the hair away from his eyes with my hand. He looked peaceful, almost as if he was sleeping. After a very long time, I calmed down and stood up. There was a bald, middle-aged man at the door, and I figured from his clothing he was one of the hotel staff. Are you enjoying your stay, sir? He asked with a toothy grin. Uh, no, I'd like to go now, I said, drained of all energy. Of course, sir. You are free to leave any moment you like. We just need you to choose a payment method before you check out. A payment method? The services of the event were not included with the event invitation. He grinned again. I knew there was no way I would be able to leave before paying up, and I had a feeling they were not interested in money. And I was right. The man reached behind his back and presented a noose. If you prefer, here is the widely popular method. When he saw my reaction, he raised his eyebrows and said, We also have an alternate method of payment, if this one is not to your liking. He opened a door to the left and stepped aside, and my heart jumped to my throat when I saw a gagged and tied woman on her knees. Her makeup was smeared across her face from crying, and when she saw me, she became hysterical. It was my ex-wife, Karen. I looked at the hotel employee who, in addition to the noose, held a kitchen knife in his other hand. The choice here was obvious. I grabbed the knife and approached Karen, who became even more hysterical, trying to say something over her gag, but I ignored her. I couldn't stand to hear what she wanted to say, whether it be judging me or begging for her life. I'm sorry for what I did to Josh. It was for the best, and you know it, Karen. He was holding us back. He never could have had a normal life. And I did what I had to do. Now as for you, it's your turn next. Because I'm definitely not dying today. I took the knife from the doorman and butchered her. Ten minutes later, I was back in the hotel lobby. Thank you for choosing the hotel rejuvenation. The perky hotel receptionist smiled. We hope you enjoyed your stay and please recommend us to your friends and family. I shot her a glance and walked out without a response. These motherfuckers. As I entered my car, I glanced to the hotel one last time. Whether it be the devil or somebody else, they're always trying to get their ounce of blood, aren't they? As I entered my car, I glanced to the hotel one last time, only to see figures and windows staring at me. 
I drove off, and I was questioned by the police a few days later. Apparently, my ex-wife Karen had been found dead in an old building outside the town, which served as a hotel before it went out of business. Apparently, this was a popular location for people to either commit suicide or murder. I wasn't a suspect, so they thanked me and left, which is entirely their fault because the police are fucking idiots. I went to work the next day and everything was as it was before my vacation. I never told anyone about my trip, and whenever asked by my co-workers, I would simply shrug it off saying it was an ordinary vacation and would avoid going into any details. After all, when you live like me in private, nobody really knows who you are. The hotel rejuvenation was my punishment, but it also served as a reminder of what horrible thing I did to my son. I will have to live with that for the rest of my life, but as I said, it was for the best. Aside from the slight guilt that I feel, one question in particular keeps gnawing at me every night, which does concern me a great deal. Who paid for my stay in the hotel? Was it an invitation by someone downstairs or someone upstairs. That's what keeps me up at night.